Corpus Juris, ad hominem to coque, post hoc ergo propter hoc, quod, I, I know all of these things and it's so hard to say. Every once in a while, a genius changes the legal landscape forever. Sometimes that genius isn't even a lawyer. And scholars will look back on history as the days before the Onion filed its Supreme Court brief and the days after, because we are all changed. Now, it's not surprising because according to the Onion Supreme Court brief, the Onion rose from its humble beginnings as a print newspaper in 1756, and now enjoys a daily readership of 4.3 trillion and has grown into the single most powerful and influential organization in human history. Yes, the Onion has filed its first ever amicus brief and it started with the top, the US Supreme Court. Its brief immediately took law Twitter by storm and I've read a lot of briefs in my time and trust me, they are not all as funny and precise as this one. And people have asked if real lawyers were actually involved in this particular brief. Yes, the authors of this momentous brief, the Onion's head writer, Mike Gillis, and the Onion's lawyers of record, Stephen J. Van Stempfort and D. Andrew Portinga, who are real people, I actually checked on that, pulled no punches in their brief writing, quote, the Onion knows that the federal judiciary is staffed entirely by total Latin dorks. They quote catalysts in the original Latin in chambers. They sweetly whisper starry decisis to their spouse's ears. They mutter cui bono under their breath while picking up after their neighbor's dogs. So the Onion knew that unless it pointed to a suitably Latin rallying cry, its brief would be operating far outside the court's vernacular. I feel so seen. But the question must be asked, is this a great Supreme Court brief or the greatest Supreme Court brief in history? But first we have to ask ourselves, why is the Onion filing a friend of the court brief with the Supreme Court? Well, they're standing up for Anthony Novak, an Ohio man who started mocking his local police department in March of 2016. Novak's Facebook page had the same name, cover photo, and profile photo as the Parma Police Department's official page, but it was designated a community page and didn't have the official blue check mark verifying it as an official page. Novak's page displayed the satirical slogan, we know crime. Now, Parma is Cleveland, Ohio's biggest suburb, and it has long had a reputation for being just a little bit uh, extra. And by that, I mean it has a well-documented problem with racism. In the 1970s, the Justice Department concluded that Parma's near manic growth was a classic example of white flight. The DOJ found that the city of Parma engaged in a pattern and practice of racial discrimination in housing in violation of the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And the city didn't settle with the DOJ until 1998. The Parma Police Department has been cited for refusing to hire minority police officers. Uh, Cleveland is 51% black. Its largest suburb is still less than 5% black. And I'll note parenthetically that one of the members of Team Legal Eagle is from Cleveland and informs me that the Parma police are notorious for prosecuting drivers for driving while black. Now, legendary public access host Goulardi, father of director Paul Thomas Anderson, relentlessly mocked Parma for decades. Uh, Anthony Novak clearly knew this history when he set out to mock the local cops. As Cleveland Magazine once said, quote, everyone in the country makes fun of Cleveland and everyone in Cleveland makes fun of Parma. Now, Novak's page was up for six hours and during that time it published six satirical posts. The first was an apology for, quote, failing to inform the public about an armed robbery of a Subway sandwich shop by a white man while requesting information to, quote, bring to justice an African-American woman who was loitering in front of the shop during the robbery. Novak then published a fake announcement that new police officers would be recruited based on a, quote, 15 question multiple choice definition test followed by a hearing test and strongly encouraged minorities to not apply. He followed up with an update about a pedophile reform event, promising that anyone who made it through the stations would be removed from the sex offender registry and accepted as an honorary police officer. Now, by now you are probably thinking that surely everyone who saw these pages knew it was a parody and of course was protected by the first amendment, but that's not how the Parma police saw it. Uh, they got a few phone calls from confused citizens. They immediately posted a warning on the police department's real page, letting people know that the other page was fake and that the department was investigating. The comments to the notice reveal that most citizens understood what was happening. Now, Novak thought it would be funny to post the police notice on his page verbatim, so that's what he did. Uh, Officer Kevin Riley didn't like that, and so he went on the local news where he said that the cops were launching an investigation into the page's owner. Uh, Riley described the page as, quote, but frankly, they're crude, they're demeaning, and they're very inflammatory. Our concern right now is public safety. Now, as legally idiotic as those statements were, Riley's comments did prompt Novak to take his page down, but the Parma officials did not let up. Instead, the police subpoenaed Facebook to unmask Novak. The page wasn't even up by the time that they discovered Novak's identity. Now, once they knew it was Novak, they consulted with the prosecutor, Timothy Dobek. Dobek and the officers searched for a crime to fit the situation and ultimately landed on Ohio Revised Code Section 2909.04b, a felony statute prohibiting 
prohibiting the knowing, quote, use of any computer to disrupt, interrupt, or impair the functions of any police operation. Now, how did Novak disrupt the police department? His parody caused 11 people to call up the station in confusion. But that was enough for a local magistrate who found that the cops had probable cause to search Novak's house. The police then conducted a SWAT raid on Novak's home, confiscating his gaming consoles, computers, and tablets. Police arrested Novak and threw him in jail for four days. Detective Thomas Connor told the grand jury that the callers, quote, honest to God, actually believed the page was real. Uh, the grand jury indicted Novak for disrupting public services, a fourth degree felony that carried a maximum penalty of 18 months in prison. But not surprisingly, later during a deposition, Connor admitted that none of the callers thought the parody Facebook page was real, but the damage was done. The city continues to insist to this day that 10 of those calls wasted precious dispatch time. But let's be real. Parma dispatchers probably get more useless phone calls when Rudy Strudel runs out of donuts on Packy Day. I guess that's a Cleveland joke. Now, uh, Novak stood trial and uh, lucky for him, the jury acquitted him. And after he was acquitted, he then sued the city of Parma, the police department and the police officers for violating his civil rights because that's exactly what they did. Uh, the police officers not surprisingly raised qualified immunity as a defense. Now I've talked about qualified immunity in the past, but here's a recap of this judicially invented doctrine. Qualified immunity protects state officials from being held accountable on a federal level for violating a person's constitutional rights. Uh, under this doctrine, an officer officer or state actor is immune from civil liability if a court has not previously stated that the officer's act was unconstitutional in a prior court decision. It's an idea that if there isn't a court decision on this type of constitutional violation, then they don't have notice that they were violating someone's constitutional rights. Now, qualified immunity only allows lawsuits to move forward if state officials violated a quote, clearly established statutory or constitutional right. And when determining whether or not a right was clearly established, courts consider whether a hypothetical reasonable officer would have known that the defendant's conduct violated the plaintiff's rights. Uh, what started as a way to ensure that officials were not held liable for things that they had no way of knowing were unconstitutional has now become really a serious impediment for holding police officers accountable. Uh, the federal district court for Northern Ohio denied the Parma officer's motion for qualified immunity, but the Sixth Circuit eventually overturned that decision. The court held it was not clearly established that Novak's copying of the department's notice onto his page and the deletion of user comments were protected speech. Uh, under the disruption statute, quote, the officers could reasonably believe that some of Novak's Facebook activity was not parody, not protected, and fair grounds for probable cause. The Sixth Circuit put special value on the fact that a prosecutor and magistrate agreed that there was probable cause that Novak violated the statute. Now with that somewhat depressing background in mind, we can turn to how in the world does this involve the onion? Uh, well, when someone files an amicus brief, they have to start by stating why they have an interest in the case that the court should consider. So the brief starts out by discussing the interests of the amicus, the friend of the court, in this case, the onion. Quote, the onion is the world's leading news publication offering highly acclaimed, universally revered coverage of breaking national, international, and local news events. Quote, the Onion's keen, fact-driven reportage has been cited favorably by one or more local courts, as well as Iran and the Chinese state-run media. Now, I love this part because it goes to the heart of what makes good parody. The ability of the satirist to actually make people think it might be real. And The Onion has tricked many people into reporting its stories as fact. And back in 2012, Iran's Fars News Agency published a story claiming that a Gallup poll found that rural white Americans preferred Iranian President Mahmoud uh, Ahmadinejad over President Barack. Obama. Although that feels like it might have been true, unfortunately, Ahmadinejad was ineligible for US presidency, so we'll never know if his stance about women covering their hair would have gained traction in rural Indiana, though I worry that it would. Uh, Chinese state media also thought that The Onion story declaring Kim Jong-un the sexiest man alive was real. Uh, the Onion wrote that Kim was, quote, blessed with an air of power that masks an, <laughs> an unmistakably cute, cuddly side. Uh, Kim made this newspaper's editorial board swoon with his impeccable fashion sense, short hairstyle, and of course that famous smile. Well, look, when you put it that way, it's easy to see why the 45th president had such a crush. Uh, now, The Onion brief also points out that it has a good track record of predicting future events. Quote, uh, one such coup was the onion scoop revealing that a former president kept nuclear secrets strewn around his beach home's basement three years before it even happened. 
Uh, fact check, true. <laughs> now, The Onion really did write a story in 2017 about the nuclear briefcase being left behind at Mar-a-Lago, uh, noting that it had already been there for almost two weeks. Mar-a-Lago assistant manager, Chris Mahoney, reportedly wondered if anyone was coming to collect the nuclear briefcase from the club's lost and found. Anyway, The Onion filed this brief to protect the rights of parody creators who, as a class, would prefer not to be arrested for being funny. Quote, The Onion files this brief to protect its continued ability to create fiction that may ultimately merge into to reality. As the Globe's premier parodists, the Onion's writers also have a self-serving interest in preventing political authorities from imprisoning humorists. This brief is submitted in the interest of at least mitigating their future punishment. And the brief zeroes in on the Sixth Circuit's holding that the parodist would not be protected unless they let the audience in on the joke by warning them that their parody is not true. The Onion notes that, quote, some forms of comedy don't work unless the comedian is able to tell the joke with a straight face. Parody is the quintessential example. Parodists intentionally inhabit the rhetorical form of their target in order to exaggerate or implode it, and by doing so, demonstrate the target's illogic or absurdity. Now, the hilarity of the brief is an example of the thing it seeks to protect, an ultra-serious take on a real thing that by its nature will fool some people. Or as The Onion's lawyers put it, quote, for parody to work, it has to plausibly mimic the original. And as The Onion points out in its brief, quote, to stultus s, you are dumb. These Latin words have been the Onion's motto and guiding light since it was founded in 1988 as America's finest news source, leading its writers toward the paper's singular purpose of pointing out that its readers are deeply gullible people. And they're not just crapping on their own audience. They're making an important point to quote, tricking readers into believing that they're seeing a serious rendering of some specific form, a pop song lyric, a newspaper article, a police beat, and then allowing them to laugh at their own gullibility when they realize that they've fallen victim to one of the oldest tricks in the history of rhetoric, and despite the literal falsity of parody and satire, it literally has to be false to work, it enjoys First Amendment protection, as it should. And when assessing whether satirical speech is defamation, the courts consider what a reasonable reader would have understood the author to have said, not the literal meaning of the words. And the capacity to fool the audience is essential. So in other words, a person, <laughs> Billy, no, you can't be up here. So in other words, a person doesn't have to publish a disclaimer that the writing is fake. That would ruin th the joke. Imagine how it would have ruined the punchline of Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal, which argued with a straight face that the starving Irish should just eat their own babies. And if you're worried about the onion being humble and comparing itself to Jonathan Swift, uh, well, you don't need to be. They write, quote, to be clear, the onion is not trying to compare itself to Jonathan Swift. Its writers are far more talented and their output will be read long after that hack Swift's has been lost to the sands of time. Still, The Onion and its writers share with Swift the common goal of replicating a form precisely in order to critique it from within. Uh, and as The Onion points out, Swift's goals was the same, to replicate the form, uh, the boring economic paper, in order to critique it from within. And that's why the full title of Swift's paper was A Modest Proposal for Preventing the Children of Poor People from Being a Burthen to Their Parents or Country and for Making Them Beneficial to the Public. And The Onion writers do this every day to hilarious effect. Uh, the brief points to an Onion article titled, quote, the Supreme Court rules, Supreme Court rules, which is meant to mimic the form of the Associated Press. It starts with the sentence, in a landmark decision Monday, the United States Supreme Court ruled eight to one, that it rules. And the onion follows the Associated Press form straight through into the article. It says, quote, Justice Anthony Kennedy, writing on behalf of the majority, noted that, quote, while the US Constitution guarantees equality of power among the executive, legislative, and judicial branches, it most definitely does not guarantee equality of coolness. And in this regard, the judicial branch kicks that which can be construed as total and complete ass. So the power of the parody rises from that dissonance into which the reader has been drawn. And The Onion's brief argues that because parody mimics the real thing, it has even more power to critique the real thing. Quote, parodists can take apart an authoritarian cult of personality, point out the rhetorical tricks that politicians use to mislead their constituents, and even undercut a government's institution's real world attempts at propaganda. For The Onion, this has worked time and time again, since its articles tend to expose leaders who have no ability to distinguish fact from fiction. Uh, the brief singles out one of them, uh, Republican Congressman John Fleming, who, quote, believed that he needed to warn his constituents of a dangerous escalation of the pro-choice movement after reading The Onion's headline, uh, Planned Parenthood Opens $8 Billion Abortion Plex. Of course, Yelp reviewers got in on the gag and reviewed the fake Kansas abortion plex, which convinced other readers that this was a real thing and quote, we taxpayers were paying for it. Uh, the legendary abortion plex story is still fooling people in 2022. 
And although the brief tongue in cheek called onion readers stupid, it backtracks on that claim in explaining the mental capacity of reasonable readers who quote, do not need to be told explicitly what they have no serious trouble figuring out for themselves. And the brief notes that the Supreme Court has already indicated that disclaimers aren't needed. They refer to a footnote of the opinion of Campbell versus A. Cuff Rose, uh, which of course was a very famous fair use case where the dispute was about whether the rap group Two Live Crew had a right to publish a parody of Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman. And in that case, the court said that Two Live Crew need not label their whole album or even the song a parody in order to claim fair use protection, nor should Two Live Crew be penalized for this being its first parodic essay. Parody serves its goals, whether labeled or not, and there's no reason to require parody to state the obvious or even the reasonably perceived. And The Onion argues convincingly that the Sixth Circuit's holding is contrary to the case law. The court ruled that the Parma cops, quote, could reasonably believe that some of Novak's Facebook activity was not parody, primarily because Mr. Novak deleted comments that made clear the page was fake. But the brief argues that the lack of explicit disclaimer makes no difference to whether a reasonable reader would discern that this speech was parody. Parody. And The Onion takes issue with the Sixth Circuit's view that the search warrant insulates the police from liability since other authority figures also shared the same wrongheaded view of free speech. Quote, this was not a close call on the facts. Mr. Novak's spoof Facebook post advertised that the Parma Police Department was hosting a pedophile reform event in which successful participants could be removed from the sex offender registry and become honorary members of the department after completing puzzles and quizzes. That the department had discovered an experimental technique for abortions and would be providing them to teens for free in a police van, that the department was soliciting job applicants, but that minorities were quote, strongly encouraged not to apply, and that the department was banning city residents from feeding homeless people in quote, an attempt to have the homeless population eventually leave our city due to starvation. So yeah, you'd have to be pretty dumb to think that the Facebook posts were real and also criminal. Uh, Novak can't help it if a magistrate judge and city attorney are closer to the lowest common denominator than the average reasonable reader. Uh, and The Onion also argues that uh, parodists should not be prosecuted for telling jokes. Now this seems self-explanatory, so The Onion lawyers crafted a couple paragraphs just to keep your attention. Quote, this is the 15th page of a convoluted legal filing intended to deconstruct the societal implications of parody. So the reader's attention is almost certainly wandering. That's understandable. So here's a paragraph of gripping legal analysis to ensure that every jurist who reads this brief is appropriately impressed by the logic of its argument and the lucidity of its prose. Bona vacantia, de bonus asportatus, writ of certiorari, de minimis, jus ascrescendi, forum non convenience, corpus juris, ad hominem tu coque, post hoc ergo propter hoc, quod, I, I know all of these things, it's so hard to say, quod est demonstratum, actus reus, scandulum magnatum, pactum reservati domini. See what happened? This brief itself went from a discussion of parody's function and the quite serious historical and legal arguments in favor of strong protections for parodic speech to a curveball mocking the way legalese can be both impenetrably boring and belie the hollowness of a legal position. That's the setup and punchline idea again. It would not have worked quite as well if this brief had said the following. Hello there, reader. We're about to write an amicus brief about the value of parody. Buckle up because we're going to be doing some fairly outre things, including commenting on this text form itself. So yeah, it's not good to punish funny people for saying funny things, even if those things may be offensive. And The Onion promises to quote, continue its socially valuable role, bringing the disinfectant of sunlight into the halls of power. And it would vastly prefer that sunlight not be measured out to its writers in 15 minute increments in an exercise yard. And this YouTube channel agrees. Now, normally a lawyer's conclusion is a pretty dry summary of what they want the court to do. But here the onion uh, aims high once again, quote, the petition for certiorari should be granted the rights of the people vindicated and various historical wrongs remedied. The onion would welcome any of the three, particularly the first. So what happens next? Well, the Supreme Court will decide whether to take Novak's case or not and potentially overturn uh, the Sixth Circuit's decision. Uh, if it does not, then the Sixth Circuit decision remains good law, despite it being bad law. But you'll be able to read all about the Supreme Court's next decision in today's sponsor, Morning Brew, because that's my favorite way to catch up with pop culture and the news. In fact, you could have already learned about The Onion's brief because they covered it and I read it in my email. I've actually been subscribed to Morning Brew for forever. It's one of my absolute favorite newsletters and I'm thrilled to tell you why. Uh, because Morning Brew, if you didn't know already, is a free daily newsletter delivered Monday through Sunday. It gets you up to speed on business, finance, tech, and law in just five minutes and it provides a fantastic quick 
summary of the most important issues while being witty, irreverent, and informative. And did I mention it's completely free? This week, I learned all about how Elon Musk actually bought Twitter for real this time, how Kanye West was getting denounced by everyone, and why Matt Damon killed everyone's investment returns. It's basically exactly the mix of news that I'm actually interested in, and stuff that I didn't even know I wanted to know about. And it's all written in a hilarious style. Morning Brew is one of the few emails that I actually open every day. So Legal Eagles, this one is a complete no-brainer. Morning Brew is completely free and it takes less than 15 seconds to subscribe. Just click on the link that's on screen right now or in the description to get Morning Brew for free. And not only will you get a newsletter that you'll actually read, you'll actually help out this channel too. So click on the link below to get Morning Brew right away. And after you sign up, you should click over here on this playlist to watch more Legal Eagle or I'll see you in court.